We have to acknowledge that our classics are problematic and that there are aspects of them that we will disagree with now, that they are artifacts of their moment and that in some ways they are, they are evidence of the way that things have changed as well as evidence of the things that have endured within them. So I think everybody has different definitions of a classic. So for some people, uh, a classic will be perhaps the books that they were taught at school. Some people might just think of classics as old books because they have lasted a long time and we're still talking about them today. Some people might think of as a classic as something that does something absolutely new and different to anything else because it breaks boundaries. People might think a book is a classic because it, it seems to show something that's particularly true to them. So that classics are classics because they expose true things about human psychology, because they speak to things that are universal about the human condition. Often our, our expectations about what a classic book should be like are coloured by expectations of other things that we have already read, that we have been told are classics. For example, you might think about a film director who's a big name, someone like Steven Spielberg. We know that his films are classics because we've been told that they are. The same thing happens with books, that once a certain type of book is established as a classic, things that are a bit like it also seem to have, have more value in that way. And so one of the ways in which this idea of the, the classic was established in the early 19th century is through a publishing initiative called Publishers Series. So publishers would, would print books that were either from their backlist or maybe they could get hold of cheaply and market them as, as classics. And that's really one of the first occasions where this idea that the modern novel could also be a classic comes from. And this idea that if you if you buy one, you'll collect them all, and this will give you a, a library of the classics. One thing that's perhaps quite interesting about our notions of, of what genres or what types of literature are classic is that those have changed across time. I think contemporary readers would, would think of classic literature as novels, so novels like War and Peace, novels like Moby Dick, um, but the novel itself is, is a relatively new literary form. That's where the, the term comes from, so novel, something that's new. So it merges in the, um, in the early to mid 18th century, and it's actually seen as something that's potentially quite dangerous for people to be reading, um, particularly women to be reading, because it, it offers access to often kind of forbidden love stories, cross-class romances, an intensity of emotion. And the idea is if, if women are reading thing, these things alone and privately, that this kind of secret emotional experience might be morally corrupting. Before that, if you ask people what the, the classics were, they actually possibly would have told you kind of Greek or Latin epic but they certainly wouldn't have reached for novels as classic forms, whereas nowadays I think most people would think about fiction. One of the tensions in classic literature is whether books are classics because they offer us access into and perhaps a snapshot of a particular moment in time. So does a book become a classic if, for example, it is the best evocation of early 20th century life? Or is a book a classic because it offers us access to aspects of the universal human condition? So we could think about this perhaps in relation to War and Peace. One of the things that War and Peace is, is kind of celebrated for, is known for, is its kind of particular evocations of, of the Napoleon's Russian campaign. This idea that it, it seems to kind of encapsulate this historical moment for us and give us access to that particular point in history. But at the same time, another reason why we, we value War and Peace is that it, it kind of points to larger questions that we've been asking across time. You know, what does it mean to live a good life? How do you know when you're in love? What does love look like? What kind of things give a person purpose? And I think in some ways that kind of lasting, lasting relevance or universality is something that we, we think about as being important in classic literature. Classics are, are books that are deemed to have literary value, but obviously are ideas about the kinds of people who can produce works of literary value have changed over time. The ideas that we have about the kinds of books that are worth preserving, that are worth passing on, have changed over time. 
certainly in the in the 19th century and I think really even into the 20th century we might have had this stereotype of the author as as a man as a white man possibly a man who's of, of a higher social class those are the the people whose opinions whose ideas we value those are the people whose books we're going to preserve which has meant that really the process of, of recovering books that we now think of as classics that were written by by women by people of color has often had to happen later I generally think most readers are aware that if you're reading books from the past you'll encounter ideas that have changed and actually in some ways reflecting on, on classics of the past is part of the process of changing ideas. I hope that we're already in the in the 21st century open to this idea that lots of different types of people can become authors, lots of different types of people have things of value to say, uh, can produce works of kind of great artistic merit. Which is not to say that there, there aren't still inequalities in the publishing industry, there are, and I think there have been important initiatives to kind of draw attention to it. But it's, it's more a sense of, of looking back to the past, I think, that's important and realising that the, the, the lives that people lived in the past were more diverse, were more varied, that there were more voices speaking than perhaps are currently acknowledged. Often our sense of, of what our, our past was determines our sense of, of who we are now. So I think that the bigger and more diverse our sense of the past, the better.